In this episode, I speak to Chris Garbax, wedding photographer turned CEO and head health show of Studio Ninja, a studio management software for photographers. We discuss his beginnings and story leading to and including the development of Studio Ninja as it is today. As always, there will be full podcast show notes and links as well as a whole lot more over on thephotographyjunkie.com. But without further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Chris. This is The Photography Junkie. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of The Photography Junkie podcast. This week is uh, going to be a slightly different uh, interview than usual, and I am talking with Chris Garbax this week uh, regarding his journey from being a photographer turned entrepreneur. Yeah. And the first part of this uh, show will be completely normal in terms of the interview side of things. The second part of it will definitely sound like an advert, but I promise you we are not sponsored. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Chris. Thanks for having me, Jay. It's nice that you pronounced my surname correctly. I've heard about 15,000 different versions of my surname being pronounced. So uh, good job for either just knowing it or doing your research. <laughs> it, it sounds um, Eastern European of, uh, of origin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if uh, if you want the Polish version, my name is Krzysztof Garabacz is the uh the polish <laughs> the version but here in australia or anywhere else chris garbax is uh the easy way I, I, what's the worst way you thought you've heard it pronounced so far uh not so much pronounced more i have um lots of bad memories of when i was at school i would say bad but basically i got the nickname garbage for pretty much <laughs> my my whole high school life so i'm glad i've outgrown that and uh, I didn't let let it scar me <laughs> moving into my adult life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, unfortunately, kids can be quite cruel. Um, so, so would you say that that's that's the worst that that, that has uh, been the, the? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It doesn't get much worse than that. But you know, I've uh, luckily I was tall and uh, not too many people picked on me, so I was okay in high school. I survived. So, so were you sort of? With it being Polish origins, is that sort of pre you being in Australia or have you moved to Australia? No, I was born here. My parents are both um, born in Poland and they moved to Australia in their early 20s, uh, migrated over and uh, yeah, I was born in 83, so I turned 40 uh, a few weeks ago. God, thanks for reminding me and uh, doing good, <laughs> I, man. I, I'm Feeling actually good. a little bit older, so... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, I was 79 for me. Yeah, I feel like I'm just starting, so I'm feeling good. All, um, yeah, feeling good. Everything's under control. Um, still close to my parents. My parents are still, uh, you know, I'm an only child, so I still spend quite a lot of time hanging out with the, the old man and mum, and we've got a good relationship, so very proud and happy about that. And um, I'm guessing they're, they're pretty proud of what you've uh, managed to achieve as well. Yeah, uh, it's funny. My mum and dad, you know, they were, they didn't have a lot of money. Like, dad was working two jobs. He would work nine to five and then six till after midnight to kind of cover the mortgage and, and uh, keep the family afloat. And then as I sort of finished high school, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. Um, went to uni to, I originally wanted to do like 3D animation. Like, I started having a bit of a passion for that. Uh, I went to uni to do multimedia design. So there you sort of get a, a taste of all aspects of design, typography, photography, video, 3D, all that sort of stuff. And I started getting quite a quite attracted to doing 3D animation and stuff. And then um, I got an apprenticeship with a 3D design studio. And, you know, I really enjoyed doing it when I was just playing and having fun doing it. But as soon as I started learning like the industry standards of how to produce work, you basically follow these 11 steps for every sort of animation that you do. And I very quickly got bored and I started just like forecasting, foreseeing what my life would look like. And it was, um, you know, sitting in a small cubicle, making grass animate or just 
just I don't know I just I just didn't see it as overly exciting once I sort of figured it out um which was interesting actually and then I had an injury from snowboarding so I was at home recovering from that and my roommate was working at a wedding photography studio and every day she would come home and say oh my god we're so busy the clients are always complaining because um they're so far behind in their post-production so I thought, oh, you know, I'm at home for six months recovering from this injury and I know how to retouch. Well, I know how to use Photoshop. So I called the boss and I'm like, hey, man, I heard you might need some help with your retouching. I'm around. I've got time. Uh, maybe you can throw me some work. And he said, sure, no worries. So he gave me a few uh, weddings to retouch. And then a week later, he's like, Chris, I want you in the studio. Can you come and work from here? And I said, well, I'm, in a neck, I'm, I'm wearing a neck brace, so it's not ideal, but yes, I can. So I started, got my first job as a retoucher, uh, my first official full-time job, and was retouching photos, recovered from my, my surgery, and then I think th three or four months passed, and I just started really loving the photography that I was seeing. I, I just never knew... I had no interest in photography until I started working there and the photographers that were working there were amazing and I'm like I'm looking at these photos thinking how do they do it it's so beautiful and I'm interested in this so I asked the boss hey man do you mind can I become like your wingman or can you teach me how to create these images and he said sure from now on um, you work nine to five retouching and then five to nine in the evenings, he helped me in the studio doing family portraits and portraiture and model portfolios and stuff. And on the weekends, you're with me uh, on weddings. So, you know, at the time, you know, I'm like 19, 20 years old, 21 or whatever I was, um, 22 almost. And, you know, as a young 20 year old, at the time, I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm working seven days a week now, 12 hours a day, just doing this thing. Uh, but then obviously hindsight is like, oh my God, that was just the best apprenticeship and free education schooling ever for photography. Like I had this guy who was a professional photographer teaching me everything that he knew. Um, so that was kind of my, my schooling. So then I started shooting weddings for those guys. And then I moved on and uh, worked for a commercial photography studio. And then I moved on and worked for a family portrait studio, a very busy one, uh, kind of similar to Venture, which I think you guys have or had in the in the UK. Um, yeah, yeah, we've uh, got that, and it's uh, similar. The the, uh, the upsell model, isn't it, with the Venture? Yeah, yeah, yep. So there was a similar company here in Australia that opened up, and I started working for those guys. Um, which again was a whole new experience. I, I did everything from standing in shopping centers, looking for families to to sell, um, to shooting, to retouching, to selling them uh, after the shoot. And it was quite funny. Um, I was there for a few months and then I remember I had this one sale that was about $8,000, which I'd, I met him in the shopping center. I'd called them, I got them in, I photographed them, I retouched their work and then I sold them. And so I kind of went through the whole process. Uh, and I know it was for the company, obviously, but I just had this moment where I'm like, oh my God, like if I just did one of these every three months, I, I would be totally cool. Like, I'd be fine. Um, so pretty much the next day I, I gave notice and went out on my own, which is obviously a completely different experience to just stepping into a studio. But um, yeah, I think I was about 22 at that, at that stage and I've been self-employed ever since. Now I'm 40. And... Um, shooting everything but then I, I really sort of ditched everything else and settled into weddings and fell in love with weddings and uh that was kind of my my thing so um with the uh with the polish parents uh, i've got a, a lot of polish friends and especially with uh parents from that area the whole sort of eastern bloc uh era uh, i find that they're very very hard workers and it's sort of drilled into you um, do you think that's uh, sort of influenced as uh, your, your working ethic? Uh, maybe. And actually, sorry to go back to your original question, um, where they were sort of working two jobs. So they actually bought me my first camera. So that's all I was going to say before. They, they'd saved up quite a lot of money and I was getting into photography, but I couldn't afford a camera. So they're like, Chris, you know, 
we haven't done that much for you, but here's here's our gift to you. And they used up all their savings and got me a at the time a Canon like 1D Mark II, I think it was. Um, and it was the best gift ever because it got me into photography and I was shooting with that camera. I started making money with that camera and then obviously upgraded as time went on. But um, yeah, it was a very nice gift. I, I, I talk about that. I thank my parents almost like ongoing every few years. It's like, mom and dad, that camera that you got me really set me on the right path uh, back then into an industry which really suited me. Like I'm not much of a sit still in an office you know, I, essentially under someone else's ruling. I uh, don't, don't cope that well under those circumstances. So it really allowed me to work for myself, have a lot of freedom, be creative, be outdoors, talking to people, talking with couples, talking with different clients. And um, it's just been the best. Like, I don't know, photography is an awesome, awesome career. Uh, obviously it comes with its, its challenges, but it's just such a fun job. Like if you do it, you know, if you treat it as a business, you can make a lot of money. Um, and like I said, like for weddings for me, every weekend I'm either at the beach or I'm in a winery or I'm in a forest or I've shot weddings in the snow. I've traveled overseas to shoot weddings and it's just so much fun. What um, is it about weddings that, that made you sort of gravitate towards that side of thing as opposed to sort of being a portrait photographer, for example? Um, there was a stage in my sort of late twenties where I was shooting weddings on the weekend, portraits during the week. I was doing commercial work. I was doing model portfolios. I was doing actor headshots. I was doing a bit of uh, commercial fashion stuff. And then I think I just got overwhelmed and it was just all, it was just kind of coming to an end. I'm like, I, I can't do this anymore. Um, but I thought actually the only problem is I'm just doing too much and uh, then I thought, you know, what do I enjoy the most? Um, you know, weddings, I enjoy it because it's kind of all those things together. It is a family portrait. It is a, a portrait shoot. There's a bit of fashion in there. There's a bit of editorial stuff. It's on the fly. You've got the weather challenges. The, there's a million different, you know, variables that happen, which I really enjoyed that challenge. And it pays really well. And I love the variety. And I love that there was a lot of work. You know, in the commercial world, I I personally didn't have the best experience. Um, you know, I had I had clients that were uh, they needed a quote. I quoted them. Let's just say hypothetically uh, five grand, and they're like, oh, you know, whatever, negotiate, negotiate, back and forth, back and forth. And um, I just found that, and then the actual doing the work wasn't that fun. Whereas with the wedding, you just you say your price. If they want you, they'll book you. And there was just so many weddings every every week that there was enough work for everyone so there was no shortage of work and i had great couples and yeah i just like the challenge like the whole day goes very fast there's so much variety throughout the day um i've got lots of stories i can share with you if you want to hear any of them yeah but I've yeah got lots absolutely of, lots of crazy horror stories that i came up against um uh, you know simple things like uh you know mem memory cards failing to cars breaking down and again like luckily when the memory card failed i was using a sony so i had a backup memory card thank you very much sony uh when my car broke down luckily i had an assistant that day who was also driving so i jumped in her car i was cool no problem um i did one gotcha. wedding once where um i literally had no transport so i had to ride with the bride and groom <laughs> hey but you solved the problem right like you got through it and uh, all good. I had, gosh, I had this one wedding. Uh, this is a bit of a horror story for the couple, actually, not so much for me. But uh, they just finished their their wedding ceremony. They kissed and they were walking back up the aisle, and I'm walking backwards, taking photos of them walking out of the chapel. And usually, uh, when we walk out, I'll get them to stop and sort of kiss in the archway, and I would normally get like a nice wide angle shot of the the whole chapel and then kissing in the doorway. And as I'm getting that shot. Uh, they were a Vietnamese couple and out of nowhere comes this pigeon and somehow like I don't know what it was doing but it basically flew into the side of the chapel or the cross above the chapel and and actually <laughs> fell and died on the couple's head and it was just <laughs> so dramatic um are they still together know, I'm kind of thinking um, that was a better vote at omen <laughs> You know, and especially in the Vietnamese community, uh, they're quite superstitious about this sort of stuff. Um, 
so yeah, I'm not sure if they are, but it was just like gasping, like, oh my God, I can't believe this happened. And so that, you know, there's always some crazy things that happen. Um, once, like my, my worst horror story was, um, one day on a Saturday, I was looking forward to this wedding. So I, I packed everything, got my, my lunch and my esky, you know, my, my, my cool box and um, put that in the car, said goodbye to the fam, uh, jumped in the car, drove an hour and a half to the groom's house because I normally do groom, bride, ceremony, etc. So I got to the groom's house, right on time. I was listening to Eye of the Tiger, so I'm excited and pumped and like ready to go. And I got out of my car and I opened the boot of my car and my esky was there, but my camera bag wasn't there. <laughs> So I'd literally driven an hour and a half with no camera bag and I start working like two minutes. Like oh, my, I actually took a double take. I closed my boot and I took a deep breath and I opened it again. And obviously it's not there, but I'm like, I can't believe this is happening. So just in the, in the frantic rush of being at home and being disorganized back then, I just left the house without even checking and just, and just left. So I sent a Mayday text back to my wife and said, Hey, this has happened. I need a favor. Can you drive my gear to the bride's house? It's an hour and a half drive, right? So she's like, cool, no worries. And then I just knocked on the groom's door and I'm like, dude, this crazy thing has just happened, but I'm here. I've got my phone. We're going to make it work. We're not going to let this ruin our day. Let's just do it. And he's looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm serious, but it's cool. We're going to get through this. I got the camera coming to the bride's house. Uh, you know, let's just make this work. And he looked at me and he's like, all right, man, let's do it. So basically, apart from I, I think groomsmen... I think you probably would have gotten away with that easier with the groom than the bride. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He basically said, as long as it's going to the bride's house, I don't really care. And I just had to cop a bunch of shit all day from the groomsmen and the family who were watching me. Professional photographer Chris here, um, you know, taking photos of my phone. It was a bit ridiculous, but... I survived to tell the tale. So, Crazy. Um, so what, when it comes to uh, your wedding photography, um, which do you sort of gravitate towards? Is it more the sort of stand back, <sighs> let things happen sort of style, or do you prefer the, the more sort of setup uh, of the <sighs> shots? Good question. Um, you know, I was trained in the more setup kind of way. I was a big fan of, I don't know if you know the guy, Jerry Jonas, back in the day. He's um, he's an Australian guy, Jerry Jonas. He's living in Vegas now. But when I was learning photography, I used to just watch all of his videos and would just be so impressed with the way he handled himself and his personality. And um, yeah, I personally gravitated to the more, you know, I call it setting up, but I, I, I have this funny debate with some photographers, like... Um, you know, it's not something which is totally fine. The editorial photographers that like, I just like sitting back and watching things unfold, which is totally cool. But if nothing's unfolding, or if you know, if the bride or groom are sort of looking for, I don't know, like a spark or something, then I'm kind of creating that. So yes, I do prefer. Uh, I guess you could. I would call it guided. You know, like yeah. everything's. My job is to make it look natural. The photos are of them laughing because I've said a joke or I've created an experience. Of, of whatever like um what what's the goal your go to is... uh instant laugh for everyone oh you know what's funny like it's funny you asked that back in the well even these days i'm still saying it but i used to do a shot where i would get the groomsmen to kind of spin around and give me their best as zoolander which i'm sure you know what zoolander is and, and blue you know, steel. That, that that blue steel joke worked for years and years and then i started realizing as i was sort of in my mid-30s i would say all right boys you're gonna you're going to spin around and give me the best blue steel that you can do. And then I started seeing some blank blank faces. <laughs> and they're like, what? What's blue steel? I'm like, oh my God, I'm getting old. And it's like these these uh, 20 year olds don't know what Zoolander is. And kind of uh, I started, started filling my age as time went on. But uh, yeah, I generally liked, you know, you called staging or, you know, um, prompting or whatever. I just, just preferred that it just it actually i guess enabled me to get a lot more photos with 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 laughing or whatever i was prompting um uh i would obviously do a bit of both like where where 
whatever the scene needed. Like if if, yeah. if I'm at the girl's house and they're literally just having the best time ever, I'll stand back and shoot it. But if I'm noticing that people are sort of unsure what to do or they need some guidance, then I'm there to to provide it. So my, it's pretty my usual sort of uh, go tos with uh, with couples is um, either pretend like you love each other. Yeah. <laughs> what instant? And then I, I quite like a, a confusion shot as well. So I'll say to somebody, look at the camera really, really seriously. Now think of baked beans. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, so, so it's just that, that, that sort of confusion as, as to what's going on with her face, and then that's usually when I when I take the shot. Um, yeah, and it's it's usually one that uh, it comes up as as one of their favourites when they when they end up looking back, just because of the complete natural expression of what. Yeah, and I was a bit more active too, like working at that family portrait studio. I learned to shoot family portraits with like this pulling, pushing, running, spinning, jumping, backpack, like all these different action. Um, experiences to, to to create the shot so i took that into the weddings so i got you know my grooms piggybacking the brides and spinning them around and playing a lot more games when they're during the portrait session and it wasn't necessarily the act that was worth photographing it was more the result of the act of them laughing or cuddling or whatever which really made the good shots so um what sort of, you mentioned sony before is that your sort of go-to gear um i i always like to uh, touch briefly on on people's uh, favorite sort of go-to gear. Um, so what you're shooting, what's, what's your sort of go-to lenses? God, it's funny you say this. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a huge gear guy. Uh, I, I was in the earlier days where um, I used Canon, I don't know, for three quarters of my, of my career. Um, uh, with all zoom lenses, actually, I just preferred having a zoom lens of the 2470, 7200, the wide angle, all, all that stuff. The trend is um, um, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I used to even shoot weddings with like an Ellen Crom Ranger, which back in the day is like this big studio flash that I just loved. I had my assistant carry a backpack with a huge battery pack and walk around with this light stand. Um, it was all a bit much, but it just created. At the time, I enjoyed creating these like commercial style looking photos. And obviously, you know, your you style changes over 20 years. So I really enjoyed that for a while. And then I just started getting a little bit, uh, you know, I was shooting a lot of weddings in the city and I was just kind of, it was getting a bit repetitive. It was always the same staircases, always the same parks. So I just needed to mix things up. So uh, I really started targeting couples that were more adventurous. I really wanted to do the beach weddings, the snow weddings, the mountain weddings, the forest weddings. So I started mixing up my portfolio and at the same time, I uh, sold all my Canon gear and bought Sony, uh, Sony gear. And which one did you go into initially? Uh, well, going in quite, quite late actually. So it was just the A7 III. A7 III, um, right. I was just waiting until the technology was good enough where I'm, I don't have to change batteries, you know, 10 times a day. So that that one with the grip gets me through the whole day um, without having to change batteries, which is perfect. And just the challenge of, of using the camera was completely different. But the, the three, I remember the three features, which were just mind boggling. Like it was just so, I mean, it's normal for everyone now, but when you sort of go, God, I sound like an old fuddy waddy that's gone from like, um, analog to digital but like literally like once i started using the sony which uh the eye autofocus like Ooh. such a game changer man like uh just the one of the best features ever um the uh digital viewfinder so you kind of you, you're seeing if your exposure is correct straight away like no you know, more back in the day, obviously yeah exactly yeah, yeah yeah so that that's that was a really nice change and just um, the ability for these mirrorless cameras to just to push the ISO so high. Um, like I remember with the with the Canon, I mean, it was an old cam Canon camera, but like shooting in dark places, the noise was just so, so bad. And then with Sony, you can you, your ISO can be so, so much higher. And your, the, your the good thing about photos. the Sony ISO though, even when you're pushing it so that it's grainy, it's, it's a pleasing grain. Yeah, it's like, dirt right yeah. it looks, looks kind of cool um yeah man so actually i i actually photographed my last wedding ever in may this year so after what feels like 18 years i think i mean they're having a break room done i'm not sure yet but um 
It was my last official wedding a couple of months ago. And it was an awesome one. It was a great wedding. Do you, do you think that's uh, down to uh, basically the, the, the way that your, your path has uh, diverged uh, with the, your, your current things that you do? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've got, um, you know, kids and family now and um, you know, naturally, like, for the, we'll talk about Ninja in a second, but basically eight years ago, I started Studio Ninja and even leading up to starting that, I was always looking at other businesses. So uh, for that sort of 10, almost 10 year period, um, I'd set up like an online photo selling business. I'd set up a co-sharing office space. I'd set up a, a wedding um, hens party directory. I set up a business doing a uh, hens party topless waitering business, a photo booth business, a studio hire business. Obviously then my photography stuff like the family portrait business. Um, but I was always trialing and error, like just trying different things. Um, and although most of them failed for different reasons, either I lost interest or ran out of money or learned things later along that I should have known before. Um, you know, I, I was never disheartened. I was, I always saw it. I never, every time something didn't work it out, it was never bad news. It was just like, awesome. This is like one step closer to what I actually want to do. I don't know what it is yet, but like, Maybe because I was okay designed, I wasn't having to hire people to design things for me. I could kind of build a business and a website just with my own time, um, which I just enjoyed doing. So apart from losing time, I didn't really get too scarred by like losing lots and lots of money, for example. I know people, sometimes their businesses fail and they lose a lot of money, which really sucks. Um, but luckily that didn't happen to me. So it kind of comes back to the old adage of uh, better to try and fail than not try at all. You know, what? Uh, I like, I don't know. I, I have this conversation quite often uh, with friends and my girlfriend and it's just, um, I'm not sure if it's a personality trait or what it is, but I just have like no fear in failing. Like failing just doesn't even bother me. Whereas I know for some people it's like life-changingly bad, which is understandable. It's embarrassing, it sucks, people look at you differently, you may perceive yourself as a failure, but all of those things didn't even cross my mind. I didn't care what people thought, I didn't. I wasn't fussed that I failed, and I just saw it as a stepping stone to the next thing. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if it's a mindset thing or just a, a, a sunny disposition thing, but um, every single one of those businesses that didn't work out, I'm like, cool, that wasn't the one for me. Maybe the next one will be the one for me. Um, and I just kind of knew that I, although I loved weddings, I just couldn't see myself doing it. For example, in my sixties, or like late, like like as time went on. Uh, the the uh, question's more <laughs> for me though is: Are you still shooting? Well, uh, no, actually, I'm not now. I did that last wedding, and but, um, not not weddings as such, but just shooting yeah. for you. Just just my kids, just family stuff, but nothing. Um, you know, I look back and there was there were times where I used to love it so much. I'd be up at four in the morning editing and thinking of ideas. But now I have different ideas. I think about other uh, business stuff or ideas of marketing. Like that, that's kind of driving me now. Um, like that's what I, I, I enjoy spending time and listening and learning about that stuff. Uh, so I think my photo phase is... Uh, kind of shifted. I wouldn't say it's over. I still love the business of photography. I like teaching people about the business of photography. I like teaching people about, uh, more importantly, saving time, uh, not doing the mundane, like there, there are other ways of doing things. There are other ways of uh, like running your business. People think that, you know, running the business includes everything, but as the boss and sort of CEO, you can actually there are other ways of doing things. So I like opening people's minds up to uh, different ways of running their business. So that that interests me at the moment. Um, again, we'll talk about the ninja stuff whenever, but it's 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 really nice hearing like, um, you know, I've received, for example, like a video testimonial from one of our users who's like, Chris, like literally saved my marriage. Like there was a point where I was fighting with my husband all the time 
my kids were being neglected. I was just so completely uh, all encompassed on my business and stressed about everything going on. I couldn't focus on my family. I was just like trying to keep things afloat and I was so disorganized. And now, you know, after using Ninja or after learning some things, it's like reinvigorated my marriage and I'm spending more time with my kids. I'm like, God, thank you enough. And, you know, some of that's Ninja or some of that's just a system or some of that is just outsourcing or just learning different ways of doing things that she, for example, didn't know was possible. So it's it's really nice hearing these stories of um, improve, improving people's lives from them learning something that they didn't know before. It's really, really nice. So that, that's kind of a bit more where my, where my focus is these days. So um, going on to the, the ninja stuff, um, I, I know you did a book as well, How to Shoot Like a Ninja as well. There's a bit of a theme going along with this. Uh... <laughs> I like karate ninjas, yeah. Um, look, that was a COVID, you know, COVID's pretty quiet for everyone. We had, a, we had a couple of years to think and, you know, spend time on, on different things. So that was a, I was kind of a fun project to kind of put everything I knew into writing everything I'd learned, all these stories, some of them are telling you now, like a lot of these horror stories, you know, like one, oh, here's an interesting story. So I was in Vegas for WPPI in March this year, and I was sitting next to this woman having breakfast, and we started chatting, and she's a portrait, oh, she wants to become a school photographer. Um, so I said, how's it going? How's business going? And she goes, oh, you know what? I'm a bit discouraged at the moment. So I spent all this time drafting an email and I sent the email to this school to, I wanted to photograph all of their children and my email was ignored. So now I'm kind of just a bit bummed and, you know, I'm kind of taking some time off to kind of think about my next moves. And I'm thinking to myself, I mean, this is a bit harsh, but like you sent one email to one potential prospect and they ignored you and you're giving up. Like, that's crazy. Like, well, it's just... It's crazy to think that 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 like it's it's you got to work harder than that. It can't be that easy. So I I told her an example where when I was shooting families, I've emailed 400 orthodontists saying, "Hey guys," or "Hey," I would I'd say, "Hey Ian," or "Hey Jim," or whatever. Um, um, basically running this thing where uh, you can give your patients a free photo shoot voucher to come and see me. They've just finished their braces. Their braces are coming off. They're, they're happier than ever. It's a great opportunity for them to get a, a professional photo of themselves or their family. You win because you're giving them a free gift. And I win because I'm getting a client. So we're all winning. So I sent that to 400 different orthodontists and two got back to me for a meeting. And I had both meetings and they both accepted. So it ended up working out quite nicely. And then I had a steady stream of clients coming in after that. But uh, I guess my point is it's, it's not... It's harder than people think. Like you've got to put in some time. You've got to grind a little bit. You've got to. It's not as easy as sending one email and your business is suddenly flying. It's it's a bit more work than that. Do you think that's kind of the world that we're in at the moment, though? With uh, not to uh, knock down the uh, the zennials and the, the millennials and all that side of things, but um, it always used to be okay. So it's hard work. Uh. It's interesting you say that. You know, I enjoyed the hard work, and even today with training and other things that I'm doing, I just understand that things take time. Um, yeah, I mean, younger people these days expect things quicker. You know, it's the the, the, the world we live in: internet and ordering on Amazon and arrives on your doorstep the same day. Um, you know, people are working less hours, more flexible. They want to go walk their dog at two p.m. if they're working full time job. Like, oh, I guess things are changing, which is fine. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe generalizing. Maybe some people think they're a bit more entitled than they should be. But, uh, yeah, I'm sure there's still a lot of hard workers out there, and the hard workers are the ones that do well. It's, uh, it's definitely a case that the, the hard work just doesn't go away. You have to, you have to put in the effort if you want to get the results. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and look, it's same with the the ninja story, which I'll share with you a bit later on or whatever. But uh, starting that was like like the hardest thing ever. That is not an easy thing to do. Um, but we got there in the end, and um, yeah. But yeah, it was still so. So um, with the with the 
with the ninja stuff it's um you, you said it was the hardest thing ever what what about it was uh, was the difficult part for you so um as the business was getting busier my photography business uh, I didn't have any system, so I was just juggling everything with paper or whatever, post-it notes. Um, and then, like like anyone would experience, things started falling through the cracks, and things started... I, I, I was forgetting things. Um, communicating with couples was really bad. I was just, like, getting contract signed was difficult. I was forgetting to get paid. I was forgetting to chase payments. Um, so at one point I'm like, oh my God. And then the camera bag thing happened. I basically went to a wedding without my camera. I'm like, okay, something needs to change. So I ended up asking all my friends, hey, do I hire someone? Do I get a VA? Do I, what do I do? And they're like, dude, just get a studio management software. I'm like, oh, that, I never knew that existed. So then uh, I did some Googling and there was, I think, six or seven of them available at the time. So I trialed them all. And I personally didn't love any of them. They were like, for different reasons, too hard to learn, too complicated to use not that intuitive um i mean and to be honest like some of them just didn't look the way like it's a bit not as pleasant to use from the visual aspect as i'd hoped but i settled on one of them and it was okay and then you know pretty much every wedding that i was shooting in the car i was always listening to audiobooks and i was always listening to podcasts about different things and this one day i was driving to a wedding and I was listening to a podcast about how to start a software company. I'm like, I wonder if I could start a software company. And then I thought, hmm, actually, the current studio management software that I use, I don't really like it. I, I, I use about 10% of it. It's very powerful, but I only really need 10% of it. And the rest I never, ever touch. So maybe I could build something that is kind of just 10% of that other thing. And... I'll make it really beautiful and really pretty and make it intuitive the way my brain works, make the flow work the way that a photographer's flow would work. Um, so I got really excited and all day I was excited and then I wrapped up that wedding and I got home and I went to bed and I got up at like five o'clock the next morning and I, um, I mocked up some designs, I uh, thought of the business name and I got the domain and I mocked up a website and took a couple of days and then i went to all the different facebook groups that i was in and said hey everyone i'm going to build this freaking awesome thing it's going to do this it's going to do that it's going to be so awesome and i'm looking for early adopters i'm looking for some people who can pay me up front and as a result i'll give you half price for life and i know now saying it sounds crazy but at the time it didn't sound that crazy and actually, 100 people signed up, and 100 people gave me an annual subscription uh, up front. Uh, so then I had a bunch of money. I'm like, okay, so the idea, I, I like the idea. People like the idea. So let's build this thing. Uh, and then shortly after, I was starting to prepare some things. Um, and then I had lunch with Ewan, who's the other co-founder. Uh, at the time, he was just a friend of mine who had an office in my co-sharing uh, photography studio so we would catch up for lunch every now and then and talk business and I told him about Studio Ninja and I'm going to build this thing and he's like dude do you have any idea what you're doing I'm like yeah man it's going to be fine I know what I'm doing and you know Ewan is a designer and he's managed teams before and he's had staff and I was only a solo guy anyway he liked the idea and the next day um he basically caught up with me and said, hey, Chris, I would love to be a business partner. I think I can bring a lot of value to the business. Uh, I think without me, you might be in trouble. Uh, what do you think? And I thought about it for a day. I'm like, you know what, let's do it. So we teamed up as co-founders and, and founded Studio Ninja. And it's just been the best. Um, it's been... Oh, where do I go from here? Like so many stories. It's interesting because... You know, I have the photography knowledge and he has the user experience knowledge. So together with Build Ninja, in a way, um, you know, that, that's that been a lot of thought gone into like where the buttons are and how the flow works. Whereas some of the other studio management softwares that are available are very, very powerful. But um, the founders, for example, are developers. So they just think about things differently. It's very, very powerful software, but just not really thought or... Um, really, well, in my opinion, 
like the the UX or the the way a user would get from point A to point B, how, like is just done with the developer's brain, and maybe too many steps involved, or this is too many things, and it's just not as intuitive. Anyway, um, so we worked on it for six months, and then we launched it in February of 2016, and me the naive young business owner was like, awesome, let's put it out into the world and then let's retire with millions and millions of dollars and let's go sit on a beach in Thailand and just chill, which is what I thought was going to happen. So we launched it in February and one person signed up. We had one customer. Like, oh my God, what is going on here? So we became friends with that customer and then, um, you know, kept working. And then in March, we had three customers. And then it was eight customers. And then it was 15 customers. And the months went by over and over again. So one thing, like you asked, what was really hard, uh, the growth was so slow, we were running out of money. I mean, like money, we're paying for development, which is very expensive. So we have to build this product. But, you know, with three customers, we're barely making $100 a month. So, um, you know, we kept refinancing our house, finding money from friends, finding money from finding money from family, just to keep bringing it in to try and keep this thing going to a point where eventually after four years, we had enough customers to kind of fund everything. Um, like as soon as we had enough customers that were covering costs, we'd hire another developer and then we needed a support person and then another developer. And so that was very, very stressful. Um, you know, that no, no wages for like five years. Luckily I was still shooting weddings, but um, you know, yeah. So you said that you don't have a, a fear of failure, but when when you're using other people's money to 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 fund that, um, is there has to be some sort of uh, at least in my mind there there'd have to be some sort of I need to make this work. This one was um, just bigger. The other things were almost like hobby projects. Like I just there was less risk. This one also a lot of my friends supported me with money, and a lot of my friends in the industry were using Ninja. So I had like a. Res- I felt like a responsibility that I couldn't let them down. So, you know, it uh, that doesn't happen anymore. But in the early days, you know, we had some pretty serious bugs where um, our customers, maybe at the time, like 80 customers, whatever it was, but like their calendars got modeled up. So I was seeing another photographer's calendar and they were seeing my calendar and they didn't know whose wedding they had to go to on a weekend or the servers would go down on a weekend. So I'm, I'm shooting a wedding myself, getting a thousand phone calls saying, I can't log in to find out where I need to go. And so I'm trying to like, I'm shooting my own ceremony, trying to solve this problem for, you know, hundreds of different people. So, I mean, it was very stressful. There was definitely, oh, I can't remember all of them, but it was definitely about five times where I was ready just to be like, let's just refund everyone and call it a day because uh, it's the money side and then like the bugs, we're having problems people were really relying on the software for their businesses like they were depending on it for their businesses so i had that responsibility uh kind of on me and the un so it was stressful man it was uh, it was different from just running a directory or going to a hens party with a couple of good looking guys for example like it's this was serious like people's businesses were on the line so it was really hard uh you know obviously it turned out well because we didn't give up but uh i really can see why businesses fail like it was very easy just to pull the pin i can't this is too expensive i I, you know will it will it even work how much money do we want to burn before we call it a day um but thank god we didn't you know it's 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 been the best thing ever and i'm grateful and a lot of people uh you know thousands and thousands of people will send us messages of how happy they are how it's helped them so it's 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 nice when we see the impact of it so in in your own mind um do you still think of it as a studio management software or a crm yeah interesting so you know everyone kind of calls it a crm you know we've got features from all aspects really it's you know originally it was hmm how do i answer this one this is interesting i've never been asked this before it it's, a, it's actually a, a really good project management tool is what it's sort of become. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, like Salesforce, for example, is a CRM and that is yeah. like serious client management. But there's a lot of features of Salesforce that our users would never, never need. 
that it's just like beyond them. We also have an interesting target market. Like, um, I, I would probably put your sort of nearest competitor as, as probably maybe HubSpot. Oh, uh, I've never used HubSpot, but that's also pretty advanced. We we try to keep the we on purpose try to keep the software simple, but with that decision, the reason is. Everyone wants more features, but if we just if we just threw every feature at it, it would become so complicated. And I basically just rebuilt what I didn't like about that last one that I was using. So it's really challenging to try and keep adding more and more functionality without ruining or changing anyone's current workflow. Like if you currently use the system in a certain way, we want to be able to add more functionality without having you to change anything that you currently do. And it's quite challenging. And luckily, that's Ewan's job, not mine. Um, so, you know, every day we've got our users passionately yelling and screaming about all the different things they want, which is awesome. Like, I can't think of any other community or any other service that I'm a part of, like my phone company or Netflix or anything, where I'm as active as our users are for us. It's really, really nice. Um, but it's also challenging, you know, like like a lot of people are wanting things and we could only build things so quickly. And there's, you know, which, which ones have the most, in, which features have the most impact to the most people. Anyway, back to your question. Um, it kind of does a bit of everything. It, 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 it manages your clients, but it also probably has moved into managing the shoot a bit more. Like it's, it's, it's a really good tool to, to manage your wedding, including the clients in it. But, um, you know, through the, the invoicing, the quoting, uh, all the automation that it does, um, you know, there, there are some features it doesn't have, uh, which we're looking into. Like for example, uh, a true CRM will be able to like remarket or re uh, continue to communicate with clients, you know, a, a year later or five years later. So we, we don't currently have features like that. Right now, that would be done by the, the calendar function on, on Ninja, wouldn't it? Yes, that's, that's actually tricky. So that, that can't happen automatically right now. So we're looking, we're currently looking at this new feature that we want to build called Retain. And uh, once it's built, you'll be able to basically communicate with any client at any time, ever, any, any. So like, happy anniversary, happy birthday. Hey, it's been 18 months. Let's catch up. Or anything you want to say to anyone will be able to happen um, once we build out this feature. So generally we want to build features that either save people time, that help them be more organized, which as a result makes them less stressed or help them make more money. So that's kind of, those three things are the, the kind of, um, uh, crux of, you know, they're, they're the main missions that we're trying to achieve. Um, there's lots of features that have been requested outside of those things and depending on what they are. Um, sometimes we build them, sometimes we think about them, sometimes we just put in the backlog as a future project maybe, but, um, yeah, it's really developed into quite a nice project management tool to, to really, uh, manage every aspect of a, a portrait and a wedding photographer. I mean, we've got videographers, we've got celebrants, we've got florists, DJs, car hire companies, but mainly, you know, I'm a photographer, we built it for photographers and videographers. That's, that's really our target market. Um, but it's really, you know, every software has a, has, a, has a target market and ours, you know, is for those photographers who like to keep things simple. Our competitors are really complex and are really powerful. And some photographers want a million things to customize and a, and a million different options. But for us, we keep things simple. So, yeah. Does that lean itself into, um, do, do you have, for example, a, a stance on the more sort of analytics side of things, or is that something on a wish list? Or uh, it's there. It's it's funny because, like, I understand it's important for a business to know that analy- we, we've got some basic analytics, but obviously it could be a lot more powerful. The funny thing is, even though I know it, no one's asking for it, which is interesting. Like, like, and that doesn't say that doesn't go. That doesn't mean that it's not important. Is that? Do you think that comes down to photographers not being web designers more than them actually knowing that they don't need it? Uh, I'm not sure if it's web designers. It's probably just photographers not caring. Web, web, web experience. I mean, in terms of 
Well, it depends on what you mean by analytics. Is it like money analytics? Is it like the conversion rates or is it... So so for me, for me, analytics would be, uh, for example, um, a reference uh, HubSpot, which, uh, I, I, like I said, I consider your main competitor in the CRM side of things. Uh, on theirs, you can see what the customer's journey has been yeah. up until the point where they've messaged you. So you can see like what they've what they've explored on your website. So for me, that would be the analytics aspect of it, the, the customer journey. Yeah. Um, I haven't used HubSpot, but I, I mean, they're, they're like a generalist software where you know all businesses could use HubSpot. We've got other competitors like Tave, yeah. Sprout Studio, HoneyBook, Dubsado, um, uh, Lightblue in the UK. So that's like photographer focused, right? Um, it sounds like what. Well, so basically, when I when I use HubSpot, I, I mean that as a compliment because of what you've managed to achieve with Ninja. Um, that's the that's the level that I'm placing you in terms of my mind. Amazing, that's I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, that's almost like a a lead journey, isn't it? It's like you might have. I'm not sure if HubSpot has this, but it's like a landing page, and how many people have landed on, on the landing page, and how many people yeah, have yeah, clicked so on this it, button to then become a lead, essentially. Um, yeah, you can you can configure it that way, yeah. uh, and there's also um, you can see exactly where they've been on your website as yeah. well. So, um, in terms of mine, um, when I had it on my personal photography site, um, I could see what galleries they've viewed and, and things like that. Yeah, awesome. I mean, ours is a lot simpler. We've just got our client portal where a client, a photographer's client, would go to pay staff to accept things, to sign things. Um, uh, yeah, I guess so in, in our case, when you mentioned analytics, it's it's probably I'm thinking more around, um, you know, we have some basic stuff, but it's just like to get more advanced, it's like how, uh, like like a breakdown, for example, of which product was the highest selling product out of all the products that I have. We wouldn't have that feature. Um, I mean, we have conversion rates, we have lead sources, you can see where the lead's coming from, you can see which the conversion rate for each lead source, you can, you can see that sort of stuff, but maybe like a, a um, again, no one's asking for it, so we're not in a hurry to build it. Yeah, yeah. But this is like, do I know something that our users don't? So if we do build it, like, even though they're not asking for it, by building it, will it improve their life quite a lot? I'm not sure. Um, there's other things sort of more important at the moment. And that's the funny thing with Ninja Man, like you got, a, you got 10,000 people asking you for things, and you can only build one thing at a time and each thing takes you know a month or two or three or four to build so it's just this constant priority battle of you know what's going to have the most impact next what should we do so uh, and you've only got sort of limited man resources as well to throw at something as well yeah i mean we have 11 developers working on it full time uh there's no short i mean it's a lot of people but uh you know as the company grows we are you know to funny story back in the day the dev team would, would build something overnight and just launch it. Now we build something, it gets tested by three full-time testers. It goes back into development to get fixed. We do user testing to play with it. We do beta testing to put it out to like a hundred people before it goes out to everyone. Like the whole process is just longer and more careful. Um, Cause now if we launch something that's really buggy, it's, it's like, could be catastrophic. So we're a lot, unfortunately, no, we're not, we're not slow compared to the industry, but we're slower than we used to be. Um, we still try to put things out every sort of two to four weeks, something new. Um, but yeah, sometimes things just take time. And uh, at the moment we're working on, uh, you know, it's interesting, like being a wedding photographer, at the beginning, Ninja was way more focused on the wedding photography sort of flow. And then naturally, a lot of portrait photographers started using Ninja and they're like, well, why can't I have that feature? Why can't I have this feature? So we started focusing uh, a bunch more on the portrait photographers. So we, we launched, as you probably know, uh, our online booking uh, features earlier this year. So you just check a link on the website and a client or a potential client can just come, click it, pick a package, choose a date and time and pay. And the photographer can just sit on a beach drinking pina colada while they're making bookings, which is great. But now as a result, all the wedding photographers are like, why can't I just schedule appointments? 
It's like, what? Well, yeah. So one thing at a time. So that's what we're doing next. Now we've we've kind of allowed portrait photographers to book shoots. Now we're going to build out this appointment booking thing. So wedding photographers can book appointments, sales, you know, initial sales appointments, album design appointments, pre-wedding appointments, whatever. Um, you can't put the windows in without the foundation. So there's always something. Um, but it's exciting. Like, like I love, I often joke with you and it's like in the early days, we had like 20 features on our roadmap. And I, th- I thought, great, once we finish building these 20 things, we're done and we can retire. And now, you know, eight years later, there's like a thousand new things on the roadmap. And actually the roadmap's getting longer and longer rather than getting shorter and shorter. So it's like, why is, how's this happening? Like, I thought we're supposed to be working through things to to reduce re- reduce tasks, but actually they keep getting more and more because um, the software has evolved. Our customers are giving us good ideas. Technology is improving. AI is coming. There's lots of things happening. So I was uh, about to ask on the uh, the AI question. Um, that being this year's uh, buzzword, um, it, it, can you see a future with with that being integrated? Or? Yeah, uh, probably the most natural place for it to work will be with our emails. So it will be able to. Well, we've already talked about it internally. Uh, not in production yet this is just all hypotheticals but essentially i think the best place it would work is in our emails it will be able to draft emails for you so if you're creating templates you can tell it what you what kind of template you want it to build and it will draft it for you or if um if you send an auto email say for example a, a wedding couple book you and then the workflow would automatically send a thanks for booking email and then the couple will respond uh, this AI robot essentially could could already pre-draft your response to their email based on everything it knows about all the responses. You know, it, it'll have a wealth of knowledge of like, you know, if you're trying to convert a, a, um, a customer into a, into a client, for example, the it, it would be able to know like what's a highly conversion, what's a highly converting uh, paragraph or a sentence or email that you could just send to this couple to help them convert better so you could draft that stuff for you. Do you think that would be something like ChatGPT or similar? Uh, I don't know how much input you'll be able to give it, maybe in further in, down the track.